Sounds good. All right. Um, <laughs> do you want me to go through the first two? Uh, it looks like mix. Yeah, on. please. So, mix on now. We are at quorum. Um, okay. Right. So in terms of the first first few, uh, Dave had sent out a note prior to break just around releasing the Hyperledger Fabric 1.0 security audit report. Uh, all the votes came in. That's been unanimous unanimously approved. Uh, so Dave will get that taken care of. Um, that's really just an FYI. Uh, the second one, in terms of HackFest planning, we are trying to get these mapped out for 2018. Um, for the next one, it looks like we are converging on February 20th to 22nd in LA. Uh, that would include a day zero um, on that first day. Uh, essentially, that would just be more of an intro uh, to help newbies come up the learning curve, get familiar with the code, uh, and whatnot, so they can better participate in the two full days of the Hackfest, and it doesn't get as fragmented that way. Um, with folks being out for the past two weeks, it's been a little slow to get that confirmed. We picked that thread up yesterday and hope to get this confirmed in the next couple of days and get the rest um, mapped out for the remainder of the year based on the calendar we sent out early December. Um, and as always, if anyone on this call has space at their companies, get in touch with me ASAP. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll keep you updated as we have more. And with that, I think we're on to project reporting. And I think uh, if Silas is on Hyperledger Bro, the report came in um, in December. But I think we're just kind of catching up to do readouts on that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm finally on at the same time as everyone else now, so ready to give that update. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Tyler. Would you like me to go ahead with that? Yep. Yeah. Um, so I've just got it up in front of me. I, do people have the, the the text version of this that's been up there for a while? Um, so. Uh, I guess if I work through the, the different sections and maybe embellish a bit with what's happened since then. Um, so in terms of project health, uh, I, I'm describing um, Burrow as being in a kind of transitionary period and, and ramping up. Um, and that transition is really related to it being divorced from uh, the, the somewhat divorced anyway from the previous uh, Monax tooling that brought in a lot of dependencies on uh, things like Docker really to, to sensibly run Burrow. Um, as well as an upgrade of the underlying consensus mechanism to, to the latest tendermint. So that's um, causing some issues in that we have uh, documentation linked to Monax that is becoming a little bit out of date, but we're able to talk to people on the Hyperledger chat and um, deal with that. Um, on the positives, we've got from Charter Consulting Services, there's three developers joining us from India um, who are, are new to Go. They're not new to, to Burrow. Um, they've done work with uh, our previous tooling, so they, they've got some knowledge there. Um, they need a bit of hand-holding uh, in terms of like development environment and stuff, but it does mean there's there's three full-time uh, people uh, working uh, working on Burrow. Um, there's a roadmap linked for Q1, um, which some of which may be a little ambitious, some maybe not ambitious enough, but I've split that up so that I can give you that work up between three new people. Um, I'm saying, yeah, from the Hyperledger Summit, it seemed that there's quite a lot of uh, interest, which was nice. Um, uh, from, from the community having kind of not been sure quite of the, the future of, of Burrow, I think there's definitely the desire to, to use it. Um, it's also being integrated into Fabric and Sawtooth. Um, and at the Hackfest, I was able to get uh, Adam Ludvik of Bitwise to uh, start helping me out on um, reviewing my rather large pull request, which is this uh, uh, this hyper marmot refactor, um, which uh, is still in progress. I'm, I'm actually looking for a bit of a race transition at the moment. Um, issues, right, so two key issues are we, we need to provide a Web3 compatible API. Um, some positive news on that is that um, uh, the <laughs> Fabric IBM uh, team, uh, Swetha and Jin, uh, Jay, sorry, um, uh, have a early prototype of this, probably uh, using a similar web framework that we'd want to use on the Burrow side, uh, which is Gorilla. Um, and we have a plan to try and uh, build 
that API on a, on a common abstraction layer that would allow us to share RPC code between uh, Burrow, which probably still wants its own um, Web3 RPC. The, the point of having Web3 RPC for people on the call maybe not familiar with Ethereum is this is the this is the main interface that is ex expected by um, Ethereum libraries, client libraries, and other tooling, and opens you up to the ecosystem of Ethereum tooling. Whereas what Burrow has currently is a um, kind of due to due to kind of co evolution at the time, a slightly incompatible but rather similar um, API to Web3 in, in a lot of ways. Um, so that's that's the big ticket item for Q1. Actually, I'm trying to provide something on the Burrow side for the end of January. Um, and then the other issue is around tooling. Um, since I wrote this update, I've pushed a mono repo to Monax called uh, Boz Marmot, which condenses uh, and simplifies the uh, kind of necessary Monax tooling to run and interact uh, with the Burrow chain. Well, Burrow will, will now run on its own um, without any need for Docker anyway, but um, you still need our our package tooling to deploy contracts. Really, I say you need, you could write against our RPCs, but it's a soft dependency. Um, so it packages that, it pa packages our key signing daemon, um, which incidentally, um, I did mention at Hackfest, I, I see some value there in us agreeing a common um, uh, interface and like uh, method names for a key signing interface, but we have we have a version of that, that's put into to there, um, and a compiler service. Um, so that's been uh, stripped down in the sense it's had Docker dependency removed from it and had various other things taken out that our previous tooling did. Um, that's in a slightly less cleaned up state than Burrow itself, but that will be where I'll be pointing people to get a kind of out of the box experience with Burrow um, going forward. Um, releases, yeah, so it was a while ago since V18.0 was released, but it was in the previous quarter, so it belongs in this review. Um, that um, is was was our previously supported release by Monax. Um, uh, there are uh, some bugs that are known in there, uh, but it, it it does basically work, and it works with all the existing tooling um, and by and large existing um, tutorials. Um, this this release will be replaced by a uh, the release that comes off this uh, refactored code base, which will kind of sets the tone for the future of, of what Burrow will be, which is um, this this lean um, tendermint based blockchain and also a, a library um, that, that exposes some interfaces for, for integrators uh, like Sawtooth and Fabric. Uh, <clears throat> overall activity, so I'm the only active developer on Burrow, or I had been certainly in that past quarter, really. Um, but uh, there's been a, a lot of code written by me on this refactor. I mean, too much for a single pull request, but I'm having a mea culpa on that. And then um, uh, a lot of it is stuff that's been outstanding for a long time. Um, I think I had some discussions um, with individuals about my reasoning there, and there's more justification if you follow the links. Um, so current plans, yeah, I, I could briefly just go through the buckets that exist in, in the roadmap. So, um, and, and this relates as well to what I'd like to get some of the um, Tata Consulting people to work on. So, so one bucket is Hyperledger, and that's about um, uh, going through doing a full audit of issues and trying to get some more contributions from general Hyperledger people and I'd like one of the TCS uh, developers to kind of be take a lead on that. Um, uh, Bosmama I've, I've mentioned now so this is um, certainly for us and I know for some others in the near term we're still relying on our, our tooling and our JavaScript libraries this is going to be a mono repo that has a single release rather than they were all, all of these projects were in separate repos um, and uh, a kind of uh, minimal maintenance thing that may ha exist after we have Web3, but it may not. Um, Web3 is the is the third bucket, um, so we're looking to collaborate on that, but um, I've got a common interface to, to implement that against. Um, and then I put uh, a, a fourth bucket of, um, of, of project work, so just admin around getting CI set up on Bosmama and um, Getting making sure this refactor has gone through with a proper review, it needs to be a slightly restructured. Um, now that there are a willing, there is a willing reviewer at least in the in the form of Adam. Um, and let me just go back to the update. I think I'm nearly done. So um, on the on the B point, the boss Marmont. Uh, yeah. 
are you collapsing those together in the sense that, that you're going to pull those in as binary dependencies, or are you actually collapsing the code into a single repo? The code is in a single repo. You, you can actually see that on Monac slash Bosmarmot. Um, so what were top level projects are now um, uh, are now packages in a in a in a single go repo, um, and okay. where they had dependencies um, between each other, they, they now just depend internally there. Um, the, the biggest stripping out really so the the command line interface and much of the code is identical for our package management tool. That's probably the thing that's most likely to survive because it, it may actually have a niche and there is some interest. Um, but what I've got rid of is we had a lot of um, a kind of Ansible like uh, uh, configuration files that could allow you to run different services like I, IPFS you could run and that could depend on something else and um, and a lot of that was Docker orchestration so we didn't want to keep that but what has stayed is the um, the package management so it's it's what was uh, uh, Monax uh, packages do has, has stayed in so that allows you to to run. Importantly, allows us to run our complete test suite, which is um, which is contained in, in Boss Marmot now as well, which is a, a whole set of Solidity contracts and uh, kind of uh, integration test assertions, um, which I've run incidentally. Actually, since I wrote that, I, I've now run them successfully. I've got like, I've got this race condition, um, which I found, which is possibly intended. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, and then a uh, okay. question on the Web3 stuff. When when we were all in um, Lisbon, uh, you had mentioned you were thinking about some of the trade-offs between having that interface as a separate process, like uh, we did with Seth, versus having yeah. it as a, a single process. Uh, again, you kind of went towards the latter. Yeah, so my, my reasoning was, and, and this has also changed a bit by the fact that we have in the Fabric project those guys working on a on a web3 um, interface in go in probably a library we want to use so it seems like this it, that, that lends itself more to, to sort of bothering having um, a, a separate web3 interface in burrow my reasoning was that um, uh, if this niche of um, burrow standalone mode being this single process tenement harness because you know we're using we're not even using Tendermint over a socket like Tendermint kind of it encourages sort of encourages people to do so it's if that if that's the use case and it seems a bit a bit ugly to have an out of process RPC in, in that case I don't think it's an ugly design decision and also it kind of puts us into the territory of what say Sawtooth is doing um, uh, so uh, yeah I didn't really want to take on those extra moving parts and it and it sort of depends I don't think that the other thing we have is that our existing, so I, I, our two RPC layers we have, one's called V0, one's called TM, one's used by JavaScript, one's used by um, our package management tool. Um, the V0 one at least is, or uh, both really, are not that far away from Web3. Um, in fact, they're closer to Web3 than, um, than, than what had to be done for the Sawtooth integration. So I don't think it will be, to get the basics, uh, I don't think it will be a, actually a huge piece of work. And if we if we can share code with Fabric, I think it's it's worth having that on uh, base borrow. So that that was my reasoning with not um, jumping in with 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 Adam's uh, Rust uh, implementation. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, right. I'll just finish off uh, activity maintainer diversity. Um, right, yeah, maintainer diversity is is bad. Right now, uh, it's, it's me and Casey, really. Um, uh, so Ben, our former employee, he is yeah, technically a maintainer, but I haven't really heard from him for, for a while. Um, what I think I'd like to do is uh, try and approach someone from both the Sawtooth and Fabric teams, um, if they're interested, to become maintainers. Particularly, um, and I think some of that might be contingent about how much work we end up get managing to do together over the next uh, quarter but um yeah I don't, I don't think we need to set a huge bar i you know i've certainly I, i've uh, worked with both uh Swetha, jay and um adam and I, i'm sure they're all um would be capable maintainers if they're interested really so uh, that would be a plan for getting someone else on um then also uh since tartar has has made quite this quite significant offer of help um it would certainly be nice to get someone in tartar in um currently uh the, the, like these are i guess fairly junior developers and and i wouldn't be comfortable with 
them at this stage being maintainers, but possibly some of the uh, technical leads that are supervising them or, or, or someone from Tata, it would be nice to get them on. So, so perhaps that puts us through to having better diversity in terms of we might have three maintainers from three different companies. And um, so if we can swing that, um, and I'm sure Tata would be, would, would like to have them to, to have someone act as a maintainer from, from them. So yeah, hopefully that will improve. Uh, and there's another guy who's been around for a long time actually that I could approach. So, so I, I, for the next update, um, I should be quizzed on what progress I've made on getting these maintainers on board. Um, oh, additional information. Yeah. Um, so this, this is the idea of having someone, a new contributor to act as a, as a, right, I say contributor, not maintainer, as like a hyperledger li liaison person. So this might be the somebody from Tata Consulting who is interested in working with the open source community and I think can just probably spend a little bit more of their time really reading like every, uh, well, you know, most emails on the mailing list. And you know, it's not to say that I, I wouldn't be available myself, but could um, I've got other stuff to do as well. Um, and it'd be good. I think they could it kind of increase the contributions from people who maybe have like a few hours a week um, who would be interested, but maybe the uh, the setup is 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 a bit too much of a pain. So someone who could just be on the Hyperledger chat. But um, yeah, like I said, I think the tired of people would do that. But if it, if anyone else from Hyperledger wants to to help us, like a liaison, that'd be cool. Um, and that's all. That was great. Thanks for for that download. Yep, that was very <clears throat> very nice. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, okay, thanks, Alice. Uh, so, who's doing the Explorer update? Hi, Chris. Uh, this is Parda. I'm on from uh, the DCC. But can we can we do the update next week? Oh, I see. Uh, it hasn't been submitted. Okay, I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, we 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 will. Um, Upload it to the wiki and then we'll do the update next week. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah I Thank think you. Satish actually. I think Satish actually put out the update. I think it's uh, available now. So um, I just don't know if everybody's had a chance to look at it yet. I don't have a link, so. So Tracy, I just want to modify <laughs> a few things in that update, and then um, we'll repost that one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Cool. And then Chris, just heads up, we'll do uh, Hyperledger Fabric next week as well. Yep. What goes That'll be a good one. <laughs> um, so uh, is Arno on? I didn't see him earlier. He's not. Um, Tracy, do you want to drive the um, the lab's proposal? I know there's been some discussion and some updates and comments in the margin. Um, I think Arno is probably closest to it, but um, maybe we could just have a discussion about sort of where things stand and what issues people um, uh, still have. I think there's still a little bit of, um, uh, how should we say, uh, concern about, you know, sort of what types of projects and so forth, um, I seem to recall. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you look at, uh, I think what Arno's done is he's put uh, some bold issues um, in the actual document itself, uh, things to, uh, yeah. I think, maybe discuss as a group. Um, so maybe we just go through those, uh, it looks like five separate issues, and, and maybe just have discussions on those points and see if we can come to any sort of Conclusions on them? Okay. That, How does sounds, that, sound? that sounds like a good plan. You want to drive? Okay, great. Sure, I'll drive. Um, so the first issue um, that I see is under the governance section. Um, there's a, a question around uh, what's the decision process uh, and, and do we do a vote? Uh, so basically this is around um, understanding, I think, which projects actually um, uh, come in to uh the the is this that one or this is actually um who the maintainers are it looks like so how do we decide who these maintainers are and uh and then 
also the the next question is around the actual committers to um is it committers to existing projects that can be the maintainers uh which is what the, the apache software foundation does for their labs projects or um you know could we open up the maintainer and committer list to other folks as well so those those i think are kind of a combination of two issues that we should talk about so um another thing that i think is an important issue is this will kind of be um one of the first projects where we have kind of two types of maintainers for the project where it looks like we have some kind of higher level labs maintainers and then we have some people who are actually maintainers of the code right so if i want to submit a project to labs then i get lab maintainer approval but then i might be still maintainer of that the code underneath these lab maintainers um, so we almost need a completely you know a um, you know a complete new governance model um so what so, let so so Hart, just let's be clear i think and and maybe you know maybe we just need another name the maintainers for the labs org do not serve as maintainers for any of the projects right stewards but, if anything else right of the organization to making sure that <clears throat> they're, they're the ones that sort of are the gatekeepers for what goes in and responsible for, you know, pruning the garden periodically and archiving things that are no longer relevant or being supported and so forth. Um, <clears throat> yes, when, you know, when you add a project uh, to the labs, then that's your project and you get to decide how it's governed. It's, you know, it, it's not really, uh, I mean, I think aside from, you know, periodically getting a report from the, let's call them stewards of the org on the health and, you know, well-being of the various projects inside uh, the labs org, I think the intention is that nobody gets, you know, the, the, the stewards don't get involved in the maintenance aspects of the various projects. That's, again, it's whoever submitted it, that's their, that's their thing. And that's right. pretty cool. And with what we've done, even at this level, right, when, you know, Monax contributed Burrow, well, you know, they get to choose who the initial maintainers are, and they get to choose the process for adding new ones and so forth. And we haven't really, you know, gone to the point of in insisting on absolute consistency across all the different projects about how they make those choices. Um, and I think that's... I think that's okay. I, I don't really have, I, I don't see a need why we have to sort of be dictatorial about things. I think, you know, it's best to sort of let the projects work their way through and, and, and manage themselves as they see fit. Um, and, and again, I think I see the same thing in, in what is being proposed for the labs. I wouldn't expect that the maintainers for lab project X to be maintainers of the labs org. And I think that's a different set of people. So if we want to call them something other than maintainers, we're going to call them stewards. I would be hum I would be fine with that. Okay. Yeah. That's. I mean, I had. I think we're talking about the exact same thing here. Um, I just was hoping for a little more, uh, maybe information about what happens if the say lab stewards and the lab maintainers disagree about something. Like if the lab stewards want to like deprecate or end a lab project and the like lab maintainer of the project is not. Just things like that. Um, the, these kind of corner cases, th that's all I was wondering about. I think the lab steward is a great name. Um, and I kind of had the same structure in mind as you, did, as you uh, mentioned. Okay. Um... So I think, I so, think what you uh, then, oh, go ahead, Tracy. No, go ahead, Chris, that's fine. I, so, so I was just going to say that, um, so basically then Hart, what you're really looking for is a little bit more uh, definition around the criteria for adding things in and printing them out over time. Sounds like. Exactly. Having, having a, a, 
um, a little bit more um, specificity around that, I think, would eliminate um, uh, the, the possibility for there to be conflict like you're describing if you have objective criteria that you can use to make those decisions. Is that? Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. So then it seems like we have some um, pieces that it looks like Arno has probably added uh, since we last reviewed this that I'm highlighting now, um, which are, you know, things that must be true before this can be considered for a lab. Um, but I don't, um, I don't think we have anything except for um, timing as far as like how long this hasn't been touched uh, as far as when we would deprecate something. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, what we're talking about then is just this concept of a, a little bit more around deprecation of projects. And, and when they would be deprecated, and then maybe even uh, a little more specificity around um, this decision process, right? Is it all, all stewards have to uh, agree that this should be a labs project? Is it, you know, um, two thirds? What, what is that, um, that vote that would happen um, that would cause something to be either accepted or rejected in the labs? Does that sound right, Tim? Yeah, so I also had the question of whether you were expecting the stewards to do any kind of technical review of the projects being proposed for labs. And if so, how much of a technical review? I would think not. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think that. Yeah. No, I, I would making, agree as well. Making, I there's a certain amount of evaluation up front, does it meet the mission and so forth, but I don't necessarily consider that to be uh, getting into, oh, well, from a technical perspective, it's not good or whatever, I think. I mean, so the, the issue with just completely no technical review that I have is that if I write up a Caesar cipher, it will meet the mission and be faster than everyone's, you know, crypto code, right? Or, or things like this, right? I if if I have, um, if I just if I try to do something that ostensibly meets the goal, but my like proposed technical solution is just totally wrong. It sounds, it sounds yeah, like I'm thinking about these as this is a sandbox, and people can do crazy things in a sandbox, and you shouldn't go grab something out of the sandbox to go put into production somewhere. I want to go figure out something between um, uh, Hyperledger Explorer and and uh, Burrow, and yeah, I'm going to connect them somehow with a Caesar cipher and maybe just a little proof of concept to make sure that the integration is is feasible. But nobody should grab that and use it until such time as I say, all right, this is a this should be a real project, and then I try to promote it into the regular project pipeline. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Dan. And I think that maybe for deprecating uh, projects, we should say that if there is, a dis in general, if there is a disagreement between maintainers and stewards, uh, technical steering committee maybe is the, the body that decides. So, I don't know, maybe actually pretty related. So, if you remember, like, how we came up with the whole Hyperledger Labs kind of initiative, right? We were worried about the brand, right? And then there are a few comments there about the endorsement, right? Like, whether we want to have Hyperledger endorsing a Labs project and at what stage is the Labs project. And we don't know how mature it is, right? So, I completely agree with that, right? That we shouldn't even recommend, or we, actually, we should recommend people not to use a labs project that is even pre-incubation and try it in production. But what we do give people, I think, in the Hyperledger labs versus just putting it in GitHub or in any other kind of repository is that maybe they will be exposed to more of the community, right? Because Hyperledger has a growing community. So more people are going to look at it. So even if the stewards are not going to be that technical, they will be able to, to get some feedback. Because the minute there is a hyperledger labs project, one would assume 
that more people will look at it. And if it's like a super fast uh, cipher that is not secure, or why, why are we reinventing the wheel? Other people in the community might say something, which is much different than me putting something in Git and, you know, or just, or just uh, giving, giving to people sometimes. So I think that, you know, because Hyperledger is growing in popularity and visibility, we will get a lot more feedback. I'm not, I'm not that worried about kind of people not seeing it. I think it will, it will improve visibility. And may, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe the stewards should be more kind of the maintainers in, in, in the sense of the operations, right? Like the management of things. And if there are conflicts, yes, we can, yeah, like, like the mother says, yeah, we can bring them up. But, you know, it's like, I don't know where is the, where is the, where is the kind of break even kind of point between over managing and kind of over controlling or being too free and then again the concern that we are devaluing the brand every two people are going to check in some project hey this is hyperledger labs project so we need to strike the balance right i don't know maybe we'll, maybe we'll see with time as well i don't know if we, we know everything now but i think that we will get a lot more feedback from people if it's a hyperledger labs project compared to like something in git and then people fighting over reddit whether it's an expectation or not. Yeah. I, mean, I would like to think so. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I, I tend to agree, Jonathan. I think that, you know, we want to be careful that we don't make this too much over the top because otherwise then what's the difference between what we have now, <laughs> right? Um, you know. Um, yeah, we need some freedom, right? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the one of the comments that um, Dan had made about you know five different people and you know maybe two or one, and I was thinking maybe the thing that we want is, you know for for going in anyway is some sort of a mentor approach like the Apache Software Foundation uses for new incubated projects. We may even want to think that about that for incubation, but. Um, <clears throat> You know, or maybe we could have like, you know, to get into the, you know, there's certainly the stewardship aspect, but maybe part of that is working with a mentor who's maybe a TSC member or I don't know, maybe a maintainer for one of the other uh, active projects, for instance, um, uh, help them with their proposal and and essentially sponsor their their entrance and and that, you know. Part of that could be, you know, just helping them make sure that they have people interested in what they're doing and so forth. Thoughts on that? So I, I like the sponsorship, Chris. I um, I want to make sure that we ensure to have diversity of our labs projects, right? The same way that we want diversity oh, yeah. of our projects and maintainers. So we need to be just careful and aware of that, right? That we're not falling into any sort of, um, yeah. you know, case where it's like, oh, well, I don't like that person. Or I, I know we wouldn't do that, but you, you know what I mean? It's like, how, how do we ensure that we um, kind of keep an open mind with these labs projects? Good point. But I, I do, I do like the sponsorship. I think that's a great idea, right? I, I think um, it helps kind of, I, I think the whole point of open source, right, is uh, having the ability to have that mentor help you kind of understand kind of the, the rules of the game and how things work and um, really helping you see like how the best way is to contribute, right? And, and I think we need to do that even more than we do today. Plus one. The the only downside that comes to mind with a mentor is it it seems to pull things closer to the existing projects. So if if I've got some idea from out in left field, I need to go develop a, a relationship with somebody who has an existing project. That's really not a bad thing, is it, Dan? I'm not sure. Um, 
is I think it's okay unless the sponsorship is a requirement. Um, but otherwise, you might end up in a bit of a sort of like self-reinforcing thing. I also think that from the um, I think the stewards from what Hart was saying, um, I think stewards should be like newspaper proprietors. Like they should have a nuclear option of firing the editor, but they shouldn't have <laughs> any editorial control. So you know, if it like, and I think that would put a nice like if there's I I, I think it's a good idea not to have ambiguity about whether stewards should be having an opinion on code because that's almost more likely to make conflict but you know if someone's putting out stuff because I mean clearly there is some tacit endorsement by Hyperledger of labs projects that's kind of the point yeah. Um, but yeah so at some point it must be possible to to kick out something that's really low quality but you you probably will be more likely to just let it with the rather than do that yeah I think that so, you do for me the operation now uh, yeah less technical so the reason I like the sponsorship idea largely because it provides uh, two things one is a little bit of resistance um, so that you you know you do have to build a relationship with the hyper organization if you're going to bring a project into labs um, and the second thing is the um, sort of technical sanity check. Um, I, I agree that we don't want to be in a censorship role, um, but it does make sense to have at least some, um, uh, well, sanity check on on the kind of projects that we're accepting. Okay, well, a, a related concept is uh, like the third issue note there about in Apache, they require you to be an existing committer or an existing contributor. So would we want to put up a, a requirement that if you're going to create a lab project, you have to have at least one commit into some other Hyperledger project? Yeah, that would be nice. I wonder if that's an even, it, I mean, it certainly could be nice, but I wonder if that's even a stronger um, reinforcement thing than just having to find a sponsor who was willing to think it was a good idea. Um, I don't know. Or you just have I to think it's a, it's a weaker requirement, right? You, you need to like work with some project, show that you've tried to, I don't know, compile, build, run, change, even if you change documentation, you know, at least you try to, 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 to get some people to look at what you do. And then you also get, you know, people will get familiar with you, right? So, you know, Joe Smith comes in and basically sends something to some project. We see the reaction. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's at least something more than nothing. In terms of like how he, I don't know, argues his point, defends, his, you know, like code review suggestions and stuff. It's, it's, it's another data point. But I don't know. Let's hear other people. That's my view. I said this in chat, but I'll say it again. I think that within this organization, we have a lot of different people with many very different interests across blockchain. And if no one uh, in the organization is really interested in a proposed lab project, that's probably not a good sign. Well, uh, yeah, I think we're going to have a similar problem that the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance has, right? Everybody is pulling in different directions. We should be careful of that, right? We, otherwise, nothing will take off. We, we, we don't have this problem because we have a core that is really strong, but I'm just worried about it, like a really side side project that is so remote and two people just doing it just for the branding or to raise money for an ICO. I'm really concerned about that kind of behavior, right? There is some risk there. Yeah, and I, I agree with okay. that um, we want to be careful about that risk, but I also think that when we say sponsorship, we're not trying to say something as strong as what we're saying in, say, the project proposals for the incubating projects that are coming before the TSC. We're, we're trying to say, we're, we're trying to get something, someone to vouch for, this is somebody who's, um, who wants to do this for the right reasons, and um, 
we, that that the person sponsoring is, has looked at it and said, yeah, this has some relation to what Hyperledger is, such that it's something that should be in the lab, as opposed to maybe the, the TSC as a whole, when you evaluate an incubating project where all of us make that determination. In the labs, we're, we're after something maybe a little bit more casual, but we're still after some, somebody looked at it and someone said, yeah, this belongs in Hyperledger for, for some reason. Yes, I'm, I'm not hearing any disagreement on, on sponsorship. So would we want as a secondary threshold also this criteria that they must have at least participated in some way on one of the projects, even if it's you know a single commit? Isn't that a stronger uh, requirement <clears throat> than currently proposing a project to uh, TSC for incubation? Because we don't require that for incubation. So that's an interesting thought, Dan. Um, and I, I think you know Marta has a point there, but maybe not necessarily just participation, but use of might be a criteria, right? If you uh, or if you're ex you know extending in some way an existing project, maybe that's. Yeah, so w what I read from the Apache governance page was that they're using that commit as a very simple social filter that this is at least somebody who's who's been willing to participate in a healthy way at least once. Okay. Uh, and so there's that aspect and then we could, I, I'm not sure how I feel about it one way or the other, but the other justification there is uh, maybe twofold. One is you've at least exposed yourself to something else in Hyperledger, so you aren't trying to create uh, something that you should at least have the right context for for proposing whatever lab idea you have. And then secondarily, you've you've had some sort of proof of work, if if you'll excuse the the, <laughs> the analogy there, that you know you've you've gone to some level of effort before. Uh, you've you had some cost uh, in addition to developing that sponsorship. If I've got an outstanding pull request that's been languishing for months, is that proof of elapsed time then? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, does it have to be an accepted pull request, or does it just have to be that they've actively participated. I think one motivation we might see from someone doing a lab is that they're doing something that really can't be merged and their motivation was to engage in a project but then they realized you know this is too risky or too experimental so let's can I have a lab for it instead. Yeah that's actually not a bad thought. It sounds like maybe the way to approach this rather than weakening the idea of having a commit which I quite like in some circumstances um, uh, to, you know to just being participation or whatever like maybe we could have a, a, a different types of evidence that would be acceptable so for example yeah an accepted commit uh, like maybe an, an open pull request that couldn't be merged in, in the circumstance just mentioned perhaps as well another case would be you know if you've got a, a project on github that clearly has traction um, then it would maybe seem a little bit odd to be having people jump through hoops if it's if it really is uh, you know, relevant. I guess there needs to be some way to prove that it's relevant to Hyperledger, but um, you know, something that's got many thousands of clones and is starred by people, you know, like it, 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 that, that seems to have already passed that filter. So maybe you could have multiple ways of establishing traction or whatever you want to call it. So I think out of this discussion, I'm hearing a couple of different things. The sponsor idea, well, three things actually. So call them stewards, not maintainers. So we don't have confusion around roles and so forth. Uh, the second point was um, sponsorship thought should be um, uh, flushed out. And then the third would be the engagement aspect, so restricting access um, to the labs, to um, contributors, uh, committers of an existing project. Is there any disagreement on those three points? 
I mean, again, I think they need to be fleshed out, but. Okay. I'm not hearing anything. So I agree with you, Chris. Okay. Um, so the, the, the other issue then, I think, you know, down below um, pertains to, so who are the stewards, right? Um, and how are they chosen or how are they anointed? Um, I think, you know, the proposal there um, seems to be volunteers with the approval of the TSC. Uh, I don't, I don't have a problem with that necessarily. Um, uh, I think obviously the staff, um, you know, the, the um, community architects, I think, are automatic um, unless anybody disagrees with that and then um, having volunteers with approval from the TSC seems reasonable um, I don't know that we need that many um, and the only other thing I might think about would be you know maybe it's um, uh, is, is that maybe it's a role of, um, you know, that if actively fulfilled, sort of um, grant somebody access, even if they're not necessarily a regular com contributor or committer to one of the projects to satisfying the criteria for um, uh, actively participating in, in Hyperledger. Um, thoughts on that? I mean, absolutely, if someone is a steward, they should be counted as a active participant. Yeah. Um, as I said in chat, I'd prefer if the proposal named names for initial maintainers. Um, so if the proposers wouldn't mind doing that, that would be amazing. I assume it will be, you know, Tracy, Marta, Arno, and maybe some others. Um, but I think if, you know, those should probably be named in the proposal. I think that's actually required that we name the initial maintainers. Um, well, it at least is for incubation anyway. Uh, true, because if it's approved, what do we do on day zero, right? Yeah, I agree. It's going to be good to start with a known set. I agree, Hans. Huh? So we need to make Arno volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> I think Arno actually volunteered in the previous call, so I think that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, let's add that. Okay. <clears throat> Any other issues? Oh, there's one more down here. Um, seek to some sort of agreement as part of a lab creation process. Um, I think to me, it, you know, I was wondering as we were talking, right, and this one kind of brings that to mind is, you know, we have a proposal, uh, new project proposal template that we fill out for uh, projects going into incubation and, yeah. and guessing that Arno is asking, should we have a similar sort of thing uh, for the labs projects? And is that like an agreement, right, that you will do X, Y, Z um, as part of being a lab? I, yeah. Um, I think, I think, you know, what we discussed a little bit earlier was refining the criteria. Uh, that was the fourth the other thing I, I forgot. Refining the criteria for, um, uh, you know, deprecating and so forth uh, needs to be added. 
Um, I think if we had, you know, similar to what we have for reader projects, had a life cycle um, proposal, you know, or a life cycle document for the labs that, that covered, captured this, I think that would be good. Um, I guess it could be part of this proposal itself. Keep things a little bit simple. And but it seems to me that that would be the criteria or the agreement, if you will, they're, they're agreeing to abide by, you know, the criteria that we established. If they dump and run and, you know, after some period of time, the stewards find that nobody's answering issues or questions uh, in chat or anything like that, then, you know, the, the project gets deprecated and then eventually archived. Right. Or do, do we do we think we need because we, we don't have an agreement, for instance, for you know the the the, the top level projects. There is a proposal, yes, but I don't think anybody's necessarily signing some agreement other than the IP aspects of things where they, you know with the appropriate license and so forth, but that that's already part of this as well. I think, I think it's a nice idea to have some kind of a charter that is maybe not too involved, and then it's the steward's job to make sure that the lab projects are following the charter, whatever the charter means. Okay, so it sounds like there's no strong in favor of having some sort of agreement or anything. It's more, this is our um, proposal for Hyperledger Labs, and um, we expect that you would follow kind of the, um, the ideas that are presented here. Is, is that really kind of what I'm hearing then? Right, where this is, this proposal is kind of considered to be that charter, or we would end up putting together a separate charter than. Um, uh, yeah, I think it would be uh, best to get all the criteria into, into this proposal. Okay. Yeah, and it, it, I guess it could be organized that, you know, here are the criteria for, you know, remaining in a labs project. Boom, boom, boom. If you fail to meet that, then you get deprecated and then archived. Okay. Yeah, I think it definitely needs, there needs to be some definition of active, like even if it's only one person who's bothering with it. Yep. Okay. All right, so did we catch the... And then, uh, yeah, just one last chat I see in the thing. Um, so Boz has uh, volunteered to be a steward. I know that Boz had reached out to me in an email um, when we originally sent the labs out. Um, Boz is from the blockchain tech deep dive in uh, Delft in the Netherlands. I'm sorry, in the Netherlands. Um, so I don't know, uh, you know, how we want to handle that one. Um, well, I, <clears throat> pardon me. I think um, to I think it was. Um, either Dan or Silas was suggesting that we um, have the list of proposed, the initial list of proposed stewards in as part of this thing. And then when we agree to it, that's the initial set, All right? Okay. Um, although, yeah, I think I think that should be fine. Um, he may want to introduce himself a little bit more to the TSC, but. Yeah, and I, I recall yeah, uh, I... Boss from some early contributions that, that he made to Sawtooth, so certainly in favor of uh, his continuing his contributions here. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we have one minute, and I think we're pretty much um good with this again you know please feel free to chime in in the margins um i'll catch up with arno um and um 
We'll see if we can't close this up next week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye.